Hi, I'm Jonathan Buell. I am an assistant professor in the English department at Ohio State. I'm on the cusp of becoming an associate professor. I'll be tenured as of the fall. I teach courses in technical writing, writing about science, writing about food, uh, research methods, and I am the director of business writing and technical writing. Uh, my primary research interests are in technical communication, the rhetoric of science, uh, rhetorical theory and visual rhetoric, just finished a book on multimodal communication and science, uh, another one on science and the internet. Uh, so I'm interested in how scientists use technologies, whether they're communication technologies or other kinds of technologies, to make arguments. English majors should read a book called, which I conveniently have here, Rhetorical Style. The Uses of Language in Persuasion. This is a book that was written by my dissertation director. Um, it is a comprehensive guide to the language of argument, as the back cover says, but it's really this synoptic catalog of um, rhetorical effects, the connection between linguistic choice and rhetorical effect, starting with words, working all the way up to passage construction. Uh, and I think you know, of all the things that English majors do or all that they're known for, they, they should be able to do things with words. So you, you want to be able to have a good sense of all of your options. Um, and I don't know that we always get all of our options laid out in one place. And this book, I think, does a really great job of uh, doing that. So it's from Oxford University Press, uh, 2012, if you're looking for it. I'm sure you can find it on Amazon. I don't see too many slackers in the sort of archetype, archetypical um, slacker. The, the Fast Times of, of Richmond High, uh, Sean Penn slacker. Um, I don't know that I necessarily see people who are sort of the negative connotation of overachiever either. People who just you know want to get an A just to have the A, not the, you know, they don't really want to learn. Most of the people who are engaged in my classes are there because they want to learn about professional writing for whatever reason. And they come in with different motives. They come in with very different reasons. Uh, some are there because they have to be there. The major that they're in requires it. Uh, sometimes they're there because they see professional writing as a career path and this class is a way to learn more about that uh, career. Sometimes um, folks are there not because they're interested in, in a career in professional writing, but because they feel like their writing skills for the workplace are not where they need to be, and they want to get them there before they leave the university or even as an extension course. So you have lots of different motivations for taking a course in technical writing or professional writing, writing about science. Um, and the challenge is sort of meeting the needs of that sort of varied group and creating projects that can um, sort of appeal to all those groups and meet them meet them where they are. Generally, you know, if you meet students where they are, um, communicate the value of what you're offering, um, they, they tend to, to get motivated, right? And they tend to do well. Like many people um, who I went to graduate school with, I did not find my research specialization until graduate school. Um, at least at that time, and, and where, where I went for my undergraduate, it was a small liberal arts institution, there wasn't an emphasis in rhetorical studies or writing studies. Um, I don't even know that there was a course on rhetorical theory. There definitely wasn't one on technical communication. I was an English major focusing in literature. I was a creative writing minor. Um, and so it wasn't until I got to graduate school that I knew and learned that there was this enormous field um, called rhetoric. Um, and that that field was being used in so many different kinds of situations, right? So in this enormous body of theory dating back thousands of years, uh, starting thousands of years ago. And um, it's now applied in all these other places. It's used to think about workplace writing. It's used to think about scientific communication. Um, and it wasn't until, I guess, my first graduate course in uh, rhetorical studies, which incidentally was about um, approaches to teaching technical writing. That was the first class that I, where I was introduced to that field, and I think everything else just sort of extended from there um, over the course of my master's and PhD program. Um, my dissertation advisor, very interested in rhetorical stylistics, in the rhetoric of science, in visual argument, um, and sort of I caught those contagious interests and um, pushed them 
in the work that I did in my dissertation, which has now become the work that is my book. I feel like I should have a really fantastic answer for this, like I, I'd be a lion tamer or a, an astronaut or something like that, and I don't. Um, I took a break between my master's program and my PhD program and just worked while I was doing my master's. I was an information technology administrator and consultant. I guess if I didn't go back for my PhD, I'd still be doing that. It was interesting enough work. Um, a lot of ways, the hours are better than being a professor. You work less. Um, I may have even been paid more, I don't know. Uh, but um, that's, that's probably what I would have done, is continue to work at some intersection of technology and writing. I don't know that I get that option ever. Um, if, I'm, if I'm writing 20 pages, I probably had to read 500. Um, if I'm reading 500, it's probably because I need to write 20. Um, being a professor is this vicious cycle of literacy. You're always reading something, and you're always writing something, um, in a good way. Um, I think if I had to choose, I'd rather have 500 pages read to me. Um, I'm a big fan of audiobooks. I think if I had the choice, um, I'd like to have 500 pages read to me. I'm a, a big fan of audiobooks. It's really the only way that I get to read for pleasure, uh, because there just isn't enough time to do all the reading and writing that I have to do for work, and then also do all the other things one used to do in life. So uh, audiobooks allow me to read while I take out the trash and paint the house and do those kinds of things. So, yeah. I don't know that anywhere. Um, one, you know, anywhere you visit is somebody else's home. And I'm not going to say on camera that someone's home isn't worth visiting. Um, that said, um, I've enjoyed every place I've traveled. I think travel is great for the brain. Um, it's good to get a difference in perspective. And when you're traveling, food tastes different, colors look different, um, your senses are heightened. There's a lot of just good things about travel. Um, and yeah, I would go back to anywhere I've been. Um, there are ways that I don't like to travel. Traveling without much money or any money is not fun. Uh, traveling with food poisoning, not fun. But as long as the cash flow cooperates and the GI tract cooperates, I'd go pretty much anywhere. Well, if you have students who believe that a place is the best, that's a good start. Um, but, um, and, and I think that they do believe that. Um, they believe in themselves. They believe in the value of education. Um, I guess if I had to pick a single thing, it's probably the churn, right? So every year, every fall, thousands of people come here, right? Some of the best students from across the state, the best students from around the world, right? We have an increasing population of, of international students. Um, and everybody's coming here and concentrating and bringing all that energy um, and all of their dreams, and it's here, right? And that's what makes a university possible. That's what sustains a university. It's all that energy, all that excitement. Um, it's what sustains the university, and I think it sustains a lot of people like, like me. Um, or and a lot of professors.